Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you are watching this production from. So this is episode two of the 40 Rules of Love. Well, it's a discussion of the 40 Rules of Love from the book by the same name. Now, my name is Elizabeth Carney and I am your host for today. But I am joined, as you will see, by an incredible panel of amazingly um, intelligent, wise ladies who have lots to say on this subject. So I am curious as to what is going to happen today, because we never quite know exactly what's going to happen. This is not rehearsed. This is just what you see is what you get. So without further ado, you will see if you watched episode one and if you didn't, please go and have a look at that. It was a great show, even if I say so myself. So we have two people returning from last week. We have Sandy Gilchrist and we have Christine Miller who are here again from last week. And joining us for the first time, we have Melanie Knight. Well, who are these ladies? So Melanie is a coach, a sexological body worker, a tantric guide. And basically, to sum it up, I think I'm summing this up, she helps those seeking growth in intimacy, sexuality and overall well-being. OK, and then we have Christine Miller. Christine is a coach and a Reiki uh, practitioner and, 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 and a poet and an author and a consultant and so many other things that Christine has got like years and years of experience in various different corporate roles. But now she focuses on developing personal effectiveness, creativity, leadership, and above all, untapped potential in people. She's a great researcher, a holistic healer and a published poet. So I'm looking forward to your wisdom again tonight, Christine. And again, we're joined by Sandy Gilchrist, who hails from Yorkshire and is a relationship coach. And Sandy loves nothing better than diving deep into conversations to basically see where that's going to take us, where it's going to lead and uncover whatever it uncovers. So thank you and welcome ladies. So now I'm just going to share the screen and just, I've been I've been training all week so I just have to make sure I, I share the right screen. So here we are, 40 Rules of Love. The book was by Elif Shafak. This is not so much about the book, this discussion. This is about these rules. And, you know, bearing in mind how long ago um, the timing was when, when these rules were supposed to have, have come through. And, you know, whether they are relevant in the modern world and what they actually mean to us now. So... Christine, can I start with you tonight with the first question? What's your first thoughts on rule number three? So shall I read it first? You can study God through everything and everyone in the universe because God is not confined in a mosque, a synagogue or a church. But if you are still in need of knowing where exactly his abode is, there is only one place to look for him, in the heart of a true lover. Interesting. So I'd love to know what you have to say as your first reaction to that, Christine. Well, that's quite a powerful and all-consuming statement, isn't it? That um, you can study God through everything and everyone in the universe um, 
because God is essentially everywhere. And what really grabs me, I suppose, is that there's only one place to look for for God, which is in the heart of a true lover. And I feel that uh, we probably need to talk about what what is the true lover? What what does um, Shams or Rumi or Eli Shafak mean about what is a true lover? Um, because in modern parlance, uh, I guess a, a lover has certain overtones of of, of being um, a physical lover, and I suspect that we know that that's not what this means. Um, I think the heart of a a true lover is is someone who is in love with where God is. And if God is everything and everyone in the universe, then the heart of a true lover is someone who embraces the entire world and all its people and loves the entire world and all its people and recognizes that we are all, we're all made of the same stuff, essentially. We're all um, ultimately from the same source, even though we may be very, very different in so many ways in our physical appearances, in our thinking, in our upbringing, in the way we live our lives. At our core, we are all heart-centered. We all only survive as long as we have that heartbeat, that essential core of our being. And I feel that one of the biggest challenges we have in the modern world is that our heads and our hearts have become separated. And we did touch on on uh, different aspects of the brain and the, the heart brain, the gut brain, and the brain that we have in our in our skull within our skulls, and the incredible emit this heart energy and to be heart centered. Um, so as a way of kicking kicking off, then that is that is what has come to me as in in my reflections on rule number three. Wow, thank you. That was an amazing start to this evening. So, you know, what I'm hearing here is, you know, essentially if if God is in the heart of a true lover and a true lover is basically somebody who loves everything and anybody and all things in the world, then really we all we need to do is open our eyes and open our hearts to what is around us and literally live in enjoy and and love and therefore we can find god so uh, i think if if i get that right if i paraphrase that so uh yeah that is a, a great uh great um perception great start of this rule so can i move along now to uh melanie melanie what's your observations uh, on rule number three please well, I love what Christine said there. I think I would, I just want to sort of put it a little bit in my words, I think, and it's probably similar to what Christine said, but I think this is about um, really being in love with the world. Like, and I'm, when I'm, when I say that, I mean, being amazed and living in wonder at everything that's alive in every moment. And you know, I, I've sometimes I've meditated on a flower and just the wonder of a flower and the petals and the leaves and the, like the colors, the extraordinary thing is a plant, is a flower. Um, and when you really get that the incredible nature of even just something as simple as a plant then you expand that out to the trees and go and hug and touch a tree um, and walk barefooted on the ground. 
and really, you know, dance like as if you were no one's watching like that life that you could like when you're in love with life there's an energy to it when you're in love with life you're in love with god because god made everything if that's what you believe um so for me that's that whole a whole piece there um for me the true lover i think that for me there's a couple of pieces there i think there's a the true lover, I think, is one of yourself being the true lover of God. So when you open your heart to the fact that the, uh, the, wor the world and the universe is an incredible place, then, and you're, you're appreciating God and the amazing creations that he's created in the world, then you are a lover, you're a lover of God, you're a lover of life, you're a lover of everything. And when you meet a physical lover as well, because Christine differentiated between that, but when you meet a physical lover and you're able to be like that with them, and if in return they're able to be like that with you, now that is an incredible true lover experience. Is that make sense absolutely it makes sense and all of it makes sense even though meditating on the flower i have actually sat or stood in absolute wonderment looking at at a different times snowflakes or spider webs mm. i was in south africa earlier this year and we were on a game drive and it was really early in the morning and there was spider's webs everywhere oh, wow. but they were just like they they were white it was it was like somebody had gone and artistically created them they were so brilliant that you know you, and you have to realize actually this is nature at work and it, they were so breathtakingly beautiful it was unbelievable so yeah absolutely mm. I get that and no, and I was thinking also you know is it about us? Is it about us having an open heart? And if we're open to love and to everything mm. and and that true love for us, then, you know, that's where, you know, well, love and romance and everything collides and it's the most amazing experience. Before I go on to Sunday, I just want to say something else that I just thought of about this one because it reminded me, um, this business about you know, God's not confined in a mosque, a synagogue, or a church. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. brought up Catholic. And when I got married, I didn't tell anybody. And I got married in the Everglades in um, in Florida. I told them afterwards. And mom came out shortly afterwards. And she stood there. And um, she's like, well, your dad's not very pleased with you because you didn't get married in church. And I went, oh, I'll take you to where I got married. And when we actually stood there, I said, just, just do a little circle, twirl around, look up. This is a most magnificent place. It, it's so special. You can't even describe it. I said, and look up, look up. There's all those tall trees and you see the sky above and the sun. I said, this is God's earth. God created this. I have not put any barriers between me and him. I got married out here on his earth without any bricks and things creating a barrier between us. Mm -hmm. At which point she just went, I'll go mm -hmm. back and tell that to your dad. <laughs> and and to be to be fair, mm -hmm. he 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 took that on the chin. He he mm, totally beautiful. totally gets it. But um you know, and that I hadn't thought about that in in a long, long time, but mm. it just suddenly reminded me. But uh, anyway, moving on, Sandy, what's your take on rule number three? Thank you, thank you for leaving it up as well, because it um, I've been rereading it over and over. Uh, just to finish off on your point, is there? A, there's a saying, isn't there? One is closer to God in a garden, and and it, there's a little phrase around that. I can't remember how it goes, but anyway, something around you're closer to God in a garden. Okay, um, yeah, I'm sure you probably are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
what struck me first was that this personification of God, like making it into a, a sex or a person, and so many of us, I think, now are wondering that it's more than just the visual image of a, a man sat on a throne with long silver hair. Um, because it, it is, for me, it is that. You know, I see God as being the mystery. The, the, there's been some lovely descriptive names for the thing, the energy that we don't quite know, that we have labelled God, uh, as well as other things, depending on the culture that you're in. And um, so it's interesting to me that we still hang on to it, or maybe some people still do hang on to it being he and his, when some people now actually think if, if God was anything, it'd be a woman in that creative realm that we're in. Um, so that's what struck me straight away, this his abode, and there is only one place to look for him. And um, I don't think there is just one place to look for God. Like we've been saying, it, this energy is everywhere. This miracle of life is everywhere. It's in me, it's in you, it's in a mouse, it's in a tree, it's in a leaf. It's just this cycle of death and life and this mystery that we don't really know how the planet got to be here, why we're on it how we get here, <laughs> do we choose to be born, all those sorts of things. And interestingly, as, as I say that, if, if, if that's true, we're all part of this thing that we call God. So I am God, you are God. And there is that namaste, isn't there? That is the actual greeting of the God in me sees the God in you, I think, something like that. If you were to translate it, I think that's what namaste means. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, so, something like that. I think I heard, um, I honour the divine in you. Yeah, it's yeah. Pretty much the same thing. Obviously, it's had yeah. different different translations. But it's obviously it seeing that godlike in, in each person. Yeah, I, it, and it would be great if we somehow could decide for a universally, I suppose God is the nearest thing we've got to a universal label. Is that a noun? A God, is it a noun? Of this thing that we don't really know what, what it is, but we've given it a personification. And I think that's been the sad thing about it, really, that we've moved away from the mystery and tried to make sense of it. And this question has really stirred quite a lot in me, as you can probably tell. So I do get it that um, when we embody our divine as a human being, in those moments, in those often rare moments where we come from that divine place where we walk tenderly on the earth, we treat each other with kindness and care when we're not um, grabbing out of scarcity or lack, when we are abundant and open, that is when I feel that I am in the heart of my true self-love and that's when I feel in my divine essence and it's those moments are very blissful there's a sense of bliss around it I walk and I feel different I feel floaty I feel safe I feel secure I feel held by mother nature I feel like I'm part of the big mystery of life that I have got a contribution that I'm bigger than I think I am in that sense of that I can contribute and have value um, in a way that is really honouring and cherished was the word that came there. Um, and it's remarkable, those moments. They are remarkable and then they disappear. <laughs> and I'm back to who's a human. <laughs> Such it was, well, such is one of the mysteries of life, hey. And you know, that just reminded me, you know, that this point, which many of us have experienced, many of us here, many of you watching perhaps, but I also know there's an awful lot of people that don't experience that, who do not have this opening of the heart and this sense of being part of something that is infinite and of infinite possibility and the fact that we are all connected there are an awful lot of people who don't actually believe that but it reminds me of something which even roots it in science 
Do you remember um, Dr. Brian Cox and that one series he did where he was up on top of a mountain with a piece of lump of rock in his hand and, you know, whatever it was, charcoal or, you know, volcanic rock or whatever he said it was. And he was up this mountain and he said, this is where we all started and we are all connected. And then he went on to explain all the scientific basis for it, the the whole connection. And like, you know, there are cells in each of us that are related to cells in everybody else. So if you take that, you know, the whole science versus philosophy thing goes full circle. If we're all connected and science says we are with, through people with that um, kind of voice, then the heart opening you know, if we are open to all of that and we're all connected, then if we open our heart, then we are all true lovers. So, Melanie, you're nodding there. Do you have something to add to that? No, I was just agreeing with you. I think that's beautifully put. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Christine, anything to add on this one? Think you're on mute. Oh, yes. There you go. Yes, I do. Um, because the the one Godhead concept that we have been working with in in recent times, of course, if you look at ancient Greece and Rome, they had a whole array of gods, often based on on the planets and stars and whatever, but they had. Um, they had these ideas of what what multiple gods and goddesses uh, were about, uh, that that they represented so many aspects of human life and the spirit, uh, rather than this this one rather authoritarian figure that kind of emerged. Um, and yeah, we have got that image of of, um, of the silver haired gentleman. Or, or Moses or some kind of the elders type figure. Um, but I honestly believe that at one time the goddess was the prime figure, Isis, whoever you might have chosen yeah. to worship, that the, that the goddess and the empress. Um, I, this is, I say this with a degree of lightheartedness, but I think the world was a, a much more loving place when they were guiding guiding people, when they were the, the guidance of our souls. Um, there's a very interesting book by a man called Leonard Schlein, uh, which is called The Goddess Versus the Alphabet. And um, that is to do with when, um, when writing and the intellect, this, this moves us on to the next uh, rule, I suppose, in some ways. But but it was to do with how the power of the goddess diminished um, because of intellectualism coming into play. But but yes, I you know I have this huge idea of us all being made of the same stuff that's coming from some kind of stardust or cosmic soup, and um, that we don't we don't know the air that we breathe, what we're made of. We don't know where it comes from, how far back it comes from. And, and to me, that's really awesome in the, in the kind of strongest sense of being in awe of that sense of possibility of what we are and what we can be uh, within ourselves and without in terms of relating to everyone else. So that was my, what I was yeah, thinking. Wow. Was, yeah, that is that is amazing and you know beautiful segue into rule number four. Um so let's you know for those of you that are watching, let's just read through it. Intellect and love are made of different materials. Mm -hmm. Intellect ties people in knots and risks nothing, but love dissolves all tangles and risks everything. Intellect is always cautious and advises beware too much ecstasy. Whereas love says, oh, never mind, take the plunge. Intellect does not easily break down, whereas love can effortlessly reduce itself 
to rubble. But treasures are hidden among ruins and a broken heart hides treasure. I find this one deeply, deeply moving, you know, as one that's taken the plunge and also been reduced to rubble. I am curious what you ladies of the panel have to say to this. So do you want to carry on, Christina, or shall I go to Melanie? I, I'll carry on if that's if that's okay, okay yeah. with, with everyone. Um, yes, I, I I have to say that that um, love dissolves all tangles and risks everything is really resonates very strongly with me. Uh, I I have been researching love now for over ten years, uh, love in all sorts of contexts, and I've. I walked into what Francesca and I uh, laughingly, um, laughingly christened. Uh, I've walked in to see um, the granite men in their marble halls of uh, major institutions, and I have to say that if you can, if you can kind of connect your particles with their particles in this in, in the in this sense of it's all being made of the same stuff. You can see these very, very cold people dissolve into a pile of rubble. And you can find the heart within that. And huge, huge change can take place. Actual literal transcendent transformation can take place in a person in their heart. Um, and I do think that treasures are hidden among ruins, and um, I would imagine that most of us, by the time we reach the, the tender age of 50 and more, ha have had quite a few ruins occur in our lives from which we have, um, we've, we've been the phoenix, we, we've kind of come out of the ashes into a new form into a new life for ourselves, a complete, not quite a different incarnation, but we've certainly engaged with, with change, with interior interrogation of ourselves, and we've refound the love for ourselves as we are perfect in our imperfection. And I feel that that is where, where love creates this ability to re creates the ability to recreate yourself as you learn more about yourself you can learn to love yourself more and the more you love yourself the more you're able to give love to others and the more you can give love to others they transform themselves as well so the broken heart of whatever may have caused a broken heart emerges as as reconstituted as one of the most powerful, most powerful forces ever, ever in the universe, I would say, not just on Earth. Um, so I find I find this a very moving, a very moving statement, a very moving rule. And I have literally physically witnessed love dissolving what was a very rigid situation and transforming. So I, I think I I will stop now and just cogitate a bit more. Thank you. Uh, no, that is, you know, amazing. And, you know, so much, so much in there, uh, you know, about, you know, the the granite, the granite intellectual men in their in their halls and the, you know, breaking them down and, you know, the, the hearts breaking and allowing us to, rebuild and love ourselves more I, I mean that is just goes so deep I mean I was just thinking simply a broken heart hides treasure that is just such a powerful little statement there and that you know every broken heart has lessons in there and next time you know we well maybe we learn maybe we don't perhaps we we can talk about that as well but there is experience there and that's where the treasure comes from but I'm going to I'm going to move on to to Melanie now to to see how you respond to that what Christine said or how you respond to 
this rule, what your thoughts are, same, different, whatever. Well, Take I was going to start with the intellect piece, but as you started with the heart piece, I think that's, um, I'm going to start there because for me, I was actually left a bit saddened with that one, not because it's a sad statement, but because I see and know so many people who don't learn the treasures. Um, and I think it, because because a broken heart can feel so devastating. I know of, you know, people who never open their heart again and never try and love again. Um, and you know, just thinking about my dad, actually, who... My mum and dad separated when I was four years old. Um, my dad, till the day he died, never got over that relationship. Went back to live at home with his mum and just became a sort of recluse. Um, and I think that's fairly common, maybe not that extreme, but I think a lot of us, and a lot of people who come to see me, really, really struggle to give their heart again and trust because it's because it feels so devastating um and there is treasures when I look at my own life um you know I've had two big long-term relationships that um certainly one in my 20s where you know when I was going through it, it felt like my life was over um and then somehow you know, came the other side and became stronger and more determined and was looking, re realized what I was looking for and what I'd put up with and all that sort of stuff, which is sort of the treasures, I suppose, as I see it. So I think there is a lot of treasures to be seen if you are able to really look for it in the, in the ruins, if you're able to really not beat yourself up about how you failed in a relationship, how you, you know, if you can look for it in a way that is true learning and not beating yourself up, which again, a lot of us do. Yeah, I think a lot of people close their heart, don't they? And mm. once it's closed, you know, it's, it's kind of closed, locked, soldered yeah. shut, like, you know, whatever, you know, put in a safe there's absolutely no way of opening it again. I'm I know I do know people do like that, that again. I'm never yeah. going to do that again. And I remember saying that probably um, <clears throat> at one point, actually, in my 30s. I'm never going to let someone hurt me like that again. And and it is. It's We shape, then shape our life. We avoid getting into relationships. I ended up doing casual relationships for a long, long time to avoid getting my heart broken. So I think there's, again, this is some really lovely, beautiful stuff in here if people can do the work and open themselves up. And it sometimes yeah. takes other people like coaches and stuff, people like us on the call that support people in that way. But um, isn't that, I was just thinking, isn't that what you do with treasure though? It just suddenly struck yeah. me talking about treasure. We, instead of actually, you know, looking at this treasure is something to be hidden away and protected so yeah. you know if the, if the treasure's away. in the heart it's like we look that way as well yeah 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 a big padlock and lost the key <laughs> yeah but the interesting that... piece um just to add uh, to sort of say a bit about that because i often uh talk about this uh with clients um i think in the west um we're very um, conditioned to use our brain for everything, our mind, whatever you want to call it, um, our intellect, as he's put it there. And we've, we've, people are not taught to listen to their hearts or their bodies. Um, and the heart, the intellect wasn't really designed to make decisions. Um, that intellect is keeping us safe. It's our protective zone. Um, and I love what how it puts it there. The intellect is cautious and advises beware of too much ecstasy. Um, because it is, it's designed to be keep us small and protected. Um, and people listen to it like it's the truth, like you know this voice in my head that's telling me to be safe and lock my heart away. 
is the truth. Um, and people don't realize it is just a voice in our head that is just telling us a bunch of stuff. Um, so I think that is really interesting. The other thing I love because of what I do is beware of too much ecstasy <laughs> as a psychological <laughs> body worker. But I even that I think is really appropriate because because again, because of our mind, we have a cap very often about the amount of pleasure we can accept. There's a limit on the, the amount of pleasure we can have in our life. And that is because of the intellect is always saying it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. It's too yeah. much. Yeah, I'm sure we can and have we a whole it. other discussion on that. We can. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to bring that in because we, you know, that voice is constantly limiting us and trying to keep us safe. Whereas when we start to listen to our body and our heart, that is when we can, I think, I think that's more authentically who we are. We're able to, you know, um, you know, uncover that treasure and be who we really are in life. So do you think the intellect has been um, influenced by society and the patriarchal dominance to actually suppress it? Yeah, the heart well, I and think the certainly. I, I mean, I mean to be fair, I think men also have been conditioned a lot to squash down mm -hmm. their emotions and their heart and stuff like that. Um, but we've grown up in a society in a patriarchal system that that values intellect, doesn't value mm -hmm. the heart, doesn't value our body, what our body tells us to do. It says, you know evaluate it and come up with a, an answer um, yes. and I think that's that's a huge problem of our society today oh ab absolutely and I, I can't actually see it getting better with the way it's going so I'm gonna actually now on that note uh, go over to Sunday and and see what you have to uh, say on this matter that was really interesting listening to you, Melanie. Yeah, there is lots in this, and it does sort of seem like it's got a sad ending. And um, I was listening and thinking, you know, I work with a parents who've been cut out of their children's adult children's lives, and I too see that these people. It's like more than closing down to another relationship. It's like some of us close down to life itself. So we shut the door and, and draw the curtains and our life becomes smaller and smaller because the trust goes. And it's not so much, I guess, for me, it's not so much the trust of other people. It's a trust in ourselves that we can handle what comes our way. And I think that's one of the treasures that, that I discovered for myself is actually, you know, in a way, if I can love myself enough to be sad yes if somebody left me and not close myself off to life as a result of that because it's likely that most of us will um, get a broken heart either through a divorce or a bereavement and like Christine was saying you know like at this tender age of 50 most of us have experienced some sort of loss where our heart's been broken and uh, I do think that the treasures are there's there's a list of things and I think it takes maybe it takes the intellect to actually reflect on the treasures and so that we can bring them forward in a list and make sense of them in a way because sometimes our bodies are a bit slow on the catch-up the nervous system still on an old program whereas the brain has perhaps moved into the new reality I can experience that with myself you know that I don't have anxious thoughts and yet my body is representing in anxiety with palpitations and all that sort of stuff there's something going on in the system with the old wiring the old stimulus that my brain has sort of said well you know that's not actually happening but my body doesn't believe it yet it's like for me the body's a bit slow in catching up with the new information from the intellect so it's fascinating this um 
because I'm in that sort of split between my mind knowing something and yet my body's still in the old shaky behaviours, the old manifestations of do we need to run or fight here <laughs> when neither is yeah. appropriate. And yet my body's still thinking it's not safe when my brain's telling me, well, it is. So, um, that's, in, yeah. that's interesting because I... a, a, a lot of people say that you actually have to feel the emotion to, to get the change, which would suggest it's less about the brain than, than the body. And, and what I'm hearing is your brain saying one thing, your body's saying something else. So that, that's a different route again altogether. Can I add a piece into that? Of course, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is an interesting one because I, I think I said earlier, I think the body and the heart is more authentic. But the, I think what Sunday's pointing to is that we store trauma and past experiences are stored in our body. And so when we have, when we have something happen in, in, in day-to-day life that somehow triggers a response from the past, our body is responding from that past experience until that part is healed or, or let go. I I do uh, I haven't done full on trauma work, but I loved I think can't remember his name now, um. But there's an expert in um, trauma body responses, and he talks about needing to complete the cycle. And the other thing he talks about is that dogs, um, if you see dogs fighting, they will if they fight play fight and stuff, they will they will shake themselves off and and um and shake themselves off and that's letting go of the trauma the problem is a lot of us a lot of us are not letting that trauma response go we push it down because of sort of like the intellect we're like oh just get over it move on or whatever and we're not allowing ourselves to process that trauma so this then becomes well what is the body response like somebody said it's like it's like then becomes really confusing because we're like yeah. we should be listening to the body and the heart but the heart is like you know it's we've now got a lot of trauma in our bodies so we're not sure what we're responding to and how we're responding so i just wanted to pick, bring that piece in because i think that's yeah, that is that is just awesome that is just awesome. And it, it kind of explains why, you know, you go to some of these seminars online or, you know, and, and they're there, you know, stand up, shake it about, shake it about. Mm. And people feel so uncomfortable doing that. You know, I've seen so many people on stage over recent years and, you know, they might just do it randomly. They might do it after lunch or something like that when they feel like the audience is just, yeah. but there's something else going in there because shaking it, you're shaking it out. You are changing your state. And if you're you follow Tony Robbins, state, it's like, so many can't change can... anything. Yeah. yeah. So many people are constrained in their bodies because they're, because of trauma and past experiences, like can't, can't be in their body. So I think someone else, I think it was you that said something about, didn't use the word disassociation, but we're, we're very disassociated from our bodies because mm -hmm. we've, we we've had to sort of almost leave our body to survive a lot of traumas and things that have happened to us in our past yeah because yeah. we're too busy doing that they're too busy doing the intellectual stuff and trying yeah, to keep yeah. the world turning and bring the money in and I, and all I the rest of it walking around feeling like i was a my head dragging my body around for many many years and i didn't know those kinds of words at that point but it it it's it was it's that now I was it's that feeling of all we are is a, a mind and not a body wow okay what I'm going to suggest we do now is just open up the floor so you know anybody that wants to uh chip in and and add something to this conversation for the last 10 minutes or so and then there was a silence <laughs> I should just pick on somebody again. So what do you think about shaking it all out, Christine? Yeah, um, I, I certainly 
especially in the work that I've done in the past with children um, who've been labelled as emotional and behavioural disorders, um, for want of a better word, we would do different physical movements. I would I would teach them different uh, um, sort of kinesiology, the strength uh, building aspects of of muscle muscle testing and that kind of thing. We we would do and um, sort of teach them some self defense moves as well but we would do a, a we would make sure especially when we were getting kind of to the crux of what might be the problem um we would make sure to have a lot of physical movement and changing places and of course we get we get associated with a certain position like being in a particular seat and that can be associated with, for example, with the family dinner table, or it can be associated with where distressing events have taken place. And so trying to work through where those associated feelings come from and read the body language. You know, I, I had one little boy uh, who, who was eight and um, showing behavioural challenges and um, he um, he was acting out and so so we we would we would do things together but observe you know everyone was saying oh he's so angry he's always lashing out and doing this that and the other but when we talked to each other I would say I would ask him a question and he would say, well, I feel really angry, but there's a shut down body language. And I, that is not, that's not angry manifestation. It, it turned out in the end after our, our time together that, that he was, he was actually masking sadness, but his mother had this belief and absolute reluctance to allow anybody to be sad in her presence because she felt personally responsible for sadness. And so it was okay in his house to be angry and let off steam, although in the end it wasn't because it was causing other problems. Um, and it, it, was, it was like a received emotion and a received response that this little boy was actually really deeply sad for various family reasons um but it manifested as anger and so we we kind of made up i i tend to use metaphor and we would make up stories around it and in the end we had some very really quite dramatic results um and his mother his his mother ended up um probably having better, not better, but having more transformational results than he did. But there is, there is this embodiment of where do, we, where do we keep the experiences? Where do we store those experiences? Mm -hmm. And how do we express them? How do we, how do we get yeah. rid of them? I mean, what yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that poor little lad's obviously just keeping it all bottled up in his heart, mm. you know, all that. Yeah. That is that is so sad. Yeah. yeah. There's so there, there, there are so many kids that get labelled with with behavioural difficulties where really it's 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 not anything too serious. Mm. I know, and it's I'm manifesting, stopping. but it's yeah, I know. I'm going to stop you there on that one because otherwise I will get on a soapbox. <laughs> so I think that is another discussion mm -hmm. altogether. I, I want to go back to Sunday because I know that Sunday you go out walking, um, you know, in the hills and dales around Yorkshire and you go on your bike and you get outside. Does that help you shake it all out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I used exercise 
uh, throughout my life, when I look back, I've used exercise as a way of de-stressing. But also as a kid, you know, I used to go and um, there's something about my voice. There's something about the voice. Um, I used to shout for the cows because I was milking the cows when I was little. And I used to shout and I used to shout at the top of my voice. And I missed that. I once went on to some fields on a farm and said, can I shout for the cows? And she let me. She let me. <laughs> and it was great because it was like this, go on, go on. It was really loud. And um, you know that Norwegian, uh, Swedish lady who lives in Sweden and she does loads of videos and she did the... Um, she did her cow calling. I can't remember. It's got a name in that part of the world. I can't remember what it's called. So there's something about using my voice as um as an expression of in so many ways, you know, like shouting. And I've done it would, as well as listening to us all. It seems to me that I think po possibly the number one problem for people, human beings, is that we just don't know very much about feelings and emotions and how to process them how to teach each other how to deal with them where to put them acceptance of anger is is like we're still in the dark ages with accepting anger in ourselves and in each other without us all getting into a big messy heap around it all it's like we've got all of these feelings and emotions and sensations in our body Yes, we need to contain them. It's how, and then express them. It's how and when and where. And I've got loads of little tales about. I think there should be a little in in any card shop. There should be a little tent where you can go and have a little cry because <laughs> people are buying cards for all sorts of things that stir up the emotions. And um, yeah, a, a, a crying booth in every card shop. <laughs> <laughs> crying booth but it's it's fascinating and this will probably come out in the discussion of rule number five the next one which i know um you know i'm not going to get into now i know christine commented on it on it earlier in our little uh whatsapp group but you know the next thing is we've got all this stuff all these emotions come out we don't know how to deal with them and then even when we do try and communicate we don't understand each other anyway um and so you know there's when you think how many, how long ago this, I don't know when Ellie um, wrote this book um, exactly, but it's set, you know, thousands of years ago. And in that time, and you would think that we might have got a bit better at some of this by now. Um, but it seems, you know, just like we haven't learned to avoid wars, we haven't learned to deal with our emotions, we haven't. We haven't learned very much at all, really. I mean, do we, we actually can build, know? We can and... build things and put people on the moon, but can we cry in public? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, We're nuts. Any... Human, humans are nuts, aren't we? <laughs> I wanted but, to it... where we are. I wanted to just comment on Sunday's point about shouting at the cows, because uh, it reminded me of the intellect piece. I was always told as a child I was too loud and um, <clears throat> and that made me quieten down and I think so many of us are taught that and then don't voice and again one of the things um, that I work with with women in particular is is learning to voice and I mm. think that's such a powerful thing you just said there Sunday just being able to go out and shout mm. it doesn't matter what it is Sometimes it is like we really, there is something we really need to say. Um, but our intellect, because we've been told so many times something, is the very thing that very often holds us back from saying what we need to say. Mm. We're it's stopped, we are constantly, up. we're constantly stopped, aren't we? Yeah, mm. it is It is sad growing up. It's very but I was just thinking, this this expression, this voice thing, I had two two little came to mind one of them's mm. julie andrews you know in the mountains the hills are alive <laughs> and you know slightly connected i was thinking about the the yodelers mm. you know and it's all you know it's that expression it's that they're talking to the animals as well i think the yodeling that's what that's about but you know what was julie andrews doing what was maria doing in the sound of music but getting outside in nature Mm. and expressing herself because she was so confined in that convent yeah 
Oh, which kind of you know that's just sorry Sandy you were going to say something that just popped into my head yeah I forgot what I was going to say but you've just made me sorry. think that when I'm cycling I'm going to do I, I do say hello to birds and and I'm beginning to speak <laughs> out loud now. <laughs> brilliant I love it <laughs> talk to my car, well, we... car. <laughs> car oh I talk to my car I talk to my car oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it um, hears me. I talk, I talk to my car. I talk to my dog. And um, I talk to the new I talk puppy. I to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, we do not need the men in white coats or even the ladies in white coats <laughs> to come and collect us. Trust me, we are all fine. Really, we are all fine. <laughs> even if, So if you see us wandering about the streets, talking to ourselves, we're just expressing and it's it's all yes. perfectly normal. So, you can get away with it now as well because most people think you're talking to somebody on a phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you just put, your, just put your earphones in and you'll be fine. So any um, last final thoughts on these two rules before um, we finish up today? Just a couple of words. Shall I go around the room, Sandy? Yeah, love is an open heart. Love comes from that open heart. Mm. Christine, a couple of words from you, closing comments. Oh, well, there are, there are many different kinds of love. And I think learning to express love in all these different ways, whether it's for part of the family or a sort of brotherly love, sisterly love, um, all these, and, and the agape love as well. I think learning more about the universality of love can only do us good and help us to open our hearts even further. Thank you. Wonderful. And Melanie? So for me, I think it's spending time in nature and just loving everything. Loving the plants, the trees, the birds, everything. Like bringing wonder and amazement to life. Thank you. That is just so awesome. So thank you all ladies. Once again, it has been an amazing discussion. I can't believe the time has gone so quickly. So this has been episode two of the 40 Rules of Love, which is a Silver Tent uh, TV show, a production for the Silver Tent, I should say. So if you're in Synergy, by the way, if you are in the Silver Synergy and you're watching this and you want to participate, don't be shy get in touch with us. We'd love to have even more faces on this screen, even more opinions, because as we've just discovered tonight, you know, we really do need to talk more, we need to vocalise more, and we need to understand more about love. So this has been episode two. We've only got another 18 to go, so plenty of opportunity if you want to join us. But for now, thank you and, and good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'm going to stop.